Welcome. So in this episode here, we're going to create a small utility from beginning to publish. And that is to get the size of a specific folder, as well as what are the biggest files within the folder hierarchy. And the goal is to have a simple example to do with Rust. So I'm going to call it diff. And we're going to check if it doesn't already exist. Okay, so nothing exists with this name, so it's available. So we're going to go to the my project folder and we're going to do a cargo new and we're going to call it Rust diff. And then we're going to open the Rust diff. Okay, so now we have our VS code. Couple of things. The first thing that I like to do is actually to have the target the other way around to make sure that if we have sub crates that they don't get checked in by mistakes. We're not going to have sub crates here, but in case. And then I like to exclude everything that starts with a dot, except obviously git ignore. So that's kind of a best practice that I have in, on my code. And so in this project here, we're going to use a couple of uh, libraries. The first one we're going to use is clap, and that is for the command line. That is actually a very good library to use. Then the next one here that we're going to use is called workdir, and that gives an API that will traverse the directory structure in a very efficient way. And what I'm doing is I'm removing the minor versions but you might have a different strategy. The next one here that we're going to use is a smaller one, but it's actually pretty well done. And that is file size. And the file size here allows us to display the file size in a human way, in a standard way. Uh, there's another one here, humanized, but it's a little bit more advanced and it's not as convenient to use. This one is really dead simple. Copy here. And again, the same strategy here, I'm removing the minor versions. The last one, which actually could be the first one, is going to be the this error. Okay, so now we're going to look at our source. We're going to toggle our terminal and we're going to do our cargo run to make sure that everything runs. And then we get our hello world. So we are ready to go. So now there's two little tricks here that I like to use. The first one is to add the crate attribute to disable the unused warning. And that is just during the development. Before any commit, you really need to comment this one out and to fix the code. Those warnings are very useful and very well thought out. So you definitely want to follow whatever this warning does. But as we develop, it removes a lot of noise and allows us to really focus on the errors, on making sure that everything is tight from a memory standpoint. And then after we tied up the code afterwards. And then the last one here is the cargo watch with dash Q for quiet, dash C to clear, dash X, and then even the run, we're going to do a dash Q. And that is a little long, but then after we just press save and we can go from println to println to println. So we're going to do that. And now we have the hello world. And again here, if you edit it, you just have this. And for example, here, if we do a let x equal one, two, three, which usually will complain if we press save, we don't have any warning, just a result. And so that again, this is very useful. Okay, so now let's go and let's do our first walk through the directory structure here. So we're going to look at the work there and the way it works here. So we have the dependencies and we can do a walk like this. So we're just going to copy paste this here. We're going to do a command dot on this guy to import it. There's a little bug on VS Code here, I don't know why. But it does it only once, so that's okay. And we're going to put a const here. And by default here will be will be the deer. Now we press save. And now we get all of the files. Okay, so now what we can see here is that if we toggle the Rust inlays, and I have a video on the top right here that explains how you can do a keyboard shortcut to toggle on and on the Rust analyzer inlays, we see that we have 
result of the entry. And so here's a second example here that they have is how to turn this and does a filter map that will return the value directly here. So here we're going to do into ether because we want to take the ownership is fine. And then we're going to do filter map, the closure, the entry, and then we're going to say e dot okay. So that will return an option of either the de entry or none. And filter map filters a none out. So now what we have here on the entry is only the de entry. And so we can remove this one here. And now we can press save. And then everything should work fine. We can toggle off the inlays. I don't like to have them all the time. And then press save and everything works fine. Okay, so now we want to do two things here. One is we are going to store total size of all of the files that we passed. So we're going to say, let mute total size, and that would be a U64. We're going to initialize it at zero. And we're going to do a let mute total uh, number. And that is could be just a U32. And we're going to put at zero. So here, what we're going to do is pluck out the path, entry.path. So that should be the, uh, the reference of path. And now we can say if path is file and, and entry is symlink. So we're going to ignore the symlink as well. We are going to add one to the total number. So total number plus equal one. And for the size, we are going to use the metadata. So it's going to do let metadata and we're going to do fs metadata entry dot path. For now, we're going to do the unwrap. We're going to go to fs here, comment that, and we're going to import the standard fs. And what I'd like to do is to remove the empty line here, such as they all stack up well. And then once we have that, we can do a total size and we're going to add metadata dot lens. And if we press save, it should work. Now, obviously we don't print anything, so we can comment this one out. This is a lot of noise. And here at the end, we can print it in. Number of files, total size, and that will be the total numbers and total size. Press save, and then we have it is look at the file size component that we had before. The API is relatively simple here. It's just a fit underscore four. So we're going to do on the total size fit underscore four, and we're going to let VS code doing the import command dot, and we import that. And now it doesn't do the empty line. Press save, and then we have a nice number here. By the way, I just realized one thing here is actually the entry has the metadata, I think. It still needs to be unwrapped. And then perhaps there's some optimization behind here since it gets the keys once. It's hard to say, but it's better to get this information from the entries that we get. And so we press save and then hopefully everything works fine. So there is a problem here. We are using unwrap, and the problem of unwrap is that it will actually fail, crash the program. So you want to handle those. So while you are learning, it's good to use unwrap, it goes fast. But when you are actually writing a real libraries, like we're doing right now, the goal is to avoid the unwrap as much as possible. And so what you want to do here is use the idiomatic way of doing the error handling here, which is this way. But to do that, you have to move that to another function because otherwise the main cannot trap it. You could cascade back up the errors out of the main. We could do that, but then we wouldn't have a way to customize how we want to display them. So the way that I like to do it here is usually keeping the main very small and having an fn here that we're going to call exec and that will actually do the work and will return a result and the result could be empty 
And then for now, we're going to have a box, din error, and we're going to change that later, but, and then the error, we're going to click here, command dot, and we're going to import the standard error. So make sure to import the right one. And we're going to put all our things above here. And now we can actually use the question mark, which basically will fail and will send the error here back up. And so now when we call the exec, we can do a match exec. And if it's okay, then all is good. And if it's not, we can print error. And so that works the same, but now it's clean because we have the main that will actually handle the exceptions. And then we can use the very convenient question marks everywhere. And then next we're going to see how we can use this error to even make that more structured. So we press save. And here we have an error. And this is because at the end, I need to make sure to return OK. Yeah, so at the end of the function, you need to return a result. So here we return OK, and now we press save, and everything should work. And so now our code can scale a little bit better. OK, so now what we want to do is to display the top five biggest files. First, we're going to do a constant here. We're going to call it top nums. We need to have its use size because we'll use it as a capacity later. And then we're going to say five. And then one thing that we're going to start introducing here is our own little struct that will store only the information that we need. And that will be the path, which will be just a path buff. And then the size, that will be a U64. Command dot on this one to import it. And now that we have this, we can have our mute tops, and that will be a vector of entry. And we're going to say vec with capacity because in fact, we know the capacity is the maximum capacity that it can go. And we'll see why later, but it's top nums plus one. And then we're going to keep track as well of the mean of tops. So which will be the smallest size of the top files. We're going to initialize that to zero. So now what we can do here is we can simplify that a little bit. We can return the length here and we call that the size. And then we move the size here. And then we say that if the min of the top files is less than size, then we need to add this new file to the top five. And so we're going to do a tops push entry. And we're going to take what we need. So the path and entry.path. And here we're going to take the ownership here, the two path buff. So this way here, this is a full structure here that will go, and we don't have to worry too much about lifetime. Eventually, you might want to optimize your code later, but at the beginning, and moreover for beginners or intermediate, do not hesitate to copy objects, sometimes not all the time, such as you don't have to work too hard on the lifetime. That will simplify a lot your code, and then you can refactor it. The compiler will help you refactoring without breaking anything. So here, we're also going to store the size. And here, we can just do it like this because it has the same name. So now, what we need to do is sort. We are going to do a sort by. We're going to have our AB. And we are going to compare B size CMP to the A size. And that will be a reference. So we need to do like that. So if we toggle on the rest analyzer inlays here, we can see that is a reference of entry. So this is why here you need to make sure that you have a reference of size, because that will be a reference. And now we can try to press save to see if we missed anything. And so far, so good. So we didn't print anything because we haven't done, but at least all our logic didn't break and everything is consistent. Okay, so there's one more thing here we need to do is we need to have the tops length. So if the length is greater, than the tops, the top names that we have, then we need to remove the last element. So we're going to do a pop like this. And then last, we need to update our mean of tops. And for that, we're going to take the last one. And that will return an option, actually. Pipe it to e.size. And because it will return an option, it can't really be 
none, but still the compiler doesn't know. And we could use a raw unwrap, but I really don't like to use that. And so what we're going to do is the unwrap, but with the or, so it will never fail. So either unwrap the value, or you give the default value here zero. And so now we press save to make sure everything is fine. And now we go back here, and we're going to do println top biggest files. And then we do a four, and we're going to deconstruct here the size, the path in tops.iter. And if we toggle on the inlays here, we're going to see that that is just a reference, yeah, because we're using iter and not into iter. We could use into inter because we're actually consuming it, but that's fine. And then we do the println, and here a little trick, we're going to format it here to always have four, and then we're going to do a dash, and then the file name. And this is where we're going to use our fit for that we have on the right there. Here, because it's a reference of size and we want to have and fit for take a, a full size, we are going to have to dereference it size. And then we're going to do a path to. And here we can use a tool lossy because a path string might not be UTF 8.8. 8. And so if you do a 2STR here, it will return an option. But then after we have to unwrap it, and again, the unwrapping is not a good thing to do because it might fail once in a while. So here we can definitely use the losses that will always return a string. And we press save. That is our biggest files here from this folder. Okay, so now we have the call logic working. Now it's time to make it a real command line. And that is where claps comes in. So what we want here, so let's define a little bit what we want. So we're going to put it in the readme actually. Is a good opportunity and we're going to say usage simple info diff we'll scan from current deer and list the top five biggest files and what we want as well set number of biggest files and that will be diff dash n 12 for example. So what we need here is to use clap. So let's go back here to our crate here. And let's see how clap works. We go to clap. And then we click on the documentation. And here we see how it works. Okay, so the way that claps works here, so you build your command line structure here with what you want your command line to accept. And then you call it get matches. And then from your matches, you can extract the value from the command line. There is another way here to define your structure. They have this kind of YAML format and they have different formats. But it's actually, I like it to have this builder way, such as we can use a Rust typing system and VS Code autocomplete to make sure that everything is consistent and we can even discover the API with the autocomplete. And so the way we are going to do it is we're going to put it in this own file. So we're going to put it on arcsy. And here we're going to do a mod arcsy, mod arcsy. Press save, it should work. And now when we are going to go back here, we're going to create a function. And our function will be public because we need it in the main and it's going to be oxy app. So it will return the app, which is a clap app. And the way it works is you have two lifestyle here that you need to define, which is fine, the static. And then we're going to follow uh, the thing on the right here. So we're going to do a app new, and that is going to be diff. And we're going to do the version. And here's a little trick here, this little code here, you will actually put the version that you have in your cargo to ML, you will put it as a version of your command line, which is very nice. Then we're going to do about, simple directory information. And then we're going to start with our arc. And the first arc we're going to have is going to be a with name. It's going to be number, and it will be the number of biggest files display a short 
name, so that will be our dash n. And the way it works here is we are saying that this one will text value true, because it will actually take a value. And then we press save. Hopefully everything works. So that didn't change anything yet, but at least it compiles and everything is fine. So now we have our command line. So now the way to use that is we go back to our main here. And the first thing that we are going to do, do a let arcc equal, and then we're going to do an arcc app and dash get matches. So now we can do the value of whatever. So for example, here we could say let, and we're going to do a number, our number, new size, and we're going to do equal, and we're going to do an arcc dot value of number. That is what we have here, it's this name. So that will return an option. So what we're going to do is a map. And we take the value. So now if we toggle the in A's here, we can see that the V is a string, which is if it's provided by the user. So we can parse it and we're going to do a V dot parse and we're going to use the turbo fish here and new size. And for now, we're going to use the unsafe unwrap and we'll fix that later. And then if the user didn't provide anything, what we want here is to do a safe unwrap, which is unwrap all top names. And in fact, just to be consistent here, we're going to call this one, these two guys here names, and we're going to go back here and call that names, which has everything is consistent. Press save, and then everything should be fine. Okay, so now we could pass it directly to exec. But what we're going to do is actually prepare for the future here and create the structure here that will have all of the options of the exec. So here we're going to have nums, and that is going to be a use size. And the nice thing here is the options will have all of the parse options that the exec can use. So it simplifies the execs. It doesn't have to worry about default and all these kind of things. And then we can have the parsing logic into something else. The right way here of doing the parsing is doing it as a function of option. So we can implement options and we're going to implement a method and we're going to say from RC, which is a naming convention. And then we're going to give uh, the RC type and we can toggle on the inlay and we see that is arg matches. Make sure that is imported. And then that will return an option. And later it will return a result of an option. But for now, we just return the option. So now what we're going to do is we're going to move this logic here, copy paste, and we're going to move it here. And we're going to return the options names. So one thing I like to do is keep the name consistent such as uh, we don't have to do reassignment here. And so that should work. And now here, I'm going to do a let options. So we're going to do a from arcsi and we're going to do the arcsi. That will give us the option. And then after we can pass the option here, which obviously we need to add here. And now the top nums here, we're going to take it from options. And we make sure that we don't have any other top nums. We have one here. And then we should be good. Press save. And we have our default. We have our default because we didn't pass any argument. So now what we can do here is do a dash dash because the argument needs to be passed to the run here. So we're going to do dash dash. And with the command line, you won't need to do the dash dash. And then you do a dash n. And it says that we only want three. Press enter. And now we only have three. Okay, so one of the problem here is that we're not really validating the input. So for example, if we do dash n 3D, which is obviously not a number, then what we have here is a crash. And again, Rust is safe, so the program will crash and it won't damage other things. But the error is not really user-friendly. So what we need to do is handle the exception the same way that we handle the other ones. 
And so the first things we're going to do here is create our own error type. And so that is kind of a best practice that I have. So we're going to use this error here and we're going to do the derive error debug and we're going to call it app error. We're going to go to main here and we're going to add it here to our main.rs. We go back here, press save. It will continue to work, it will crash again. Here we can have our custom error. And so here we can have our enum here, a valid number of files. And we're going to say that it takes a string such as we can show to the user what was wrong. And then that would be the message to the user, error. So that is a macro here from this error. I say dash n must be a number, but was. And the way here that the macro works is you can give a positioning index here. And so that will take the first one of the enum tuple. Now we press save, everything will work fine, except that it will still crash. And now what we can do here, we go back here and we're going to do the options and here rather to just return option, we're going to return a result of option if everything go fine, otherwise app error. Okay, so now we're going to return the okay, the result enum here, everything is fine. And then we go back up here to our main and we're going to do a match on the axi. And if we have everything okay, we're going to return the options. And then if we have an error, we're going to print it in. Error parsing input, not very user friendly, but that's okay for now. And then we do the error like this. And then we don't forget to return. So the difference between here is that the return will end the function and the expression won't end the function, we just assign the value back to options. So here we want to do a return because we don't have any option to return and we want this one to be options. Now we press save and it works. I mean, it compiles, but we still have our nasty error here. So now we can go back here and this is what we need to fix here. So we're going to do actually a match. And if we have none, then we're going to return the top num. And if we have some nums, which is the string value, we're going to do the parsing. Parsing will be like this. We'll have a nums. And the whole point was to avoid the unwrap here. And if everything works fine, it's fine. Otherwise we do all else and that will return the error that we want. So if we have an exception here, we don't really care. And we're going to use our own error and we're going to give the to string here, such as we can display to the user what it is that went wrong. And then we don't forget to make that an assignment here. And we actually need to return an error here. And then after we do the question mark. So the question mark here, when it's an error, what it will do, it will end the function and return this error. So this is what we want here. So we press save. And now we have our nice error. Okay, so now we are pretty ready to release it. So now we need to clean up some code here. So the first thing we do is we're going to go and comment this one out, press save, and we're all good to go. We knew where we wanted to land, so that's normal. But usually you might have some warnings and you just clean them up as you go. And again, follow that, it's very well thought out. Okay, so the next one here to not forget is to put the license. So I like the MIT license. And now we're going to clean up our cargo to ML. Make sure to remove the Rust prefix. So I like to have the Rust prefix in my local folder. So this is why I created it. But obviously when it's a command line, that would be silly. So make sure that you remove it. So we can specify in the package to ML what you need to include. And we're going to add our homepage here and that will be a Rust diff. Follow the same notation, we'll create it just later. And we're going to add a description simple command line to get directory information. The repository is going to be the same one as our homepage. And then we have up to five keywords. 
The next one is the categories. And then the last one is a license. So that we do what we have. And now we have a pretty good cargo to ML. Press save. We're going to make a real cargo watch here because it's depressing to watch. And we can actually stop it here. We don't need it anymore. Okay, so now we can do our first commit here. So first, let's see what we have. Git status, git commit, and we're going to do initial. Oops, I always forget about this. You do git add dash a, and now you can do this. And we're going to create our repository here on GitHub. And we are going to copy this one. I get more creative later, but so far so good. We have this, we're going to create it. And now we can copy paste this one here, add it here. We already have our main as our main branch. And so we just need to put this, push it. And then we get it there. Okay, we can go there, find the code over there. And now we're going to publish it. So to publish it here, you have to log in into Christ.io, I think is with GitHub. And then after you go to your account settings, and then you have a, a token here that you create. Then after you log in in the command line with cargo, and then check if we have the diff. We don't have it. Nobody created it still. And so now we are ready and we can do a cargo publish. And we're going actually to do a dash dash dry run to make sure that everything is working fine. Okay, that sounds good. And now actually before we push it here, I just want to make sure it works. So there's one thing here that we can do, which is a cargo install dash dash path and dot. And that will install this package as if it were downloaded. And so now we can test it in other folders, just to make sure that it works before we do the final push. I'm always paranoid about pushing something that doesn't work. So that will install it locally, as if I had done a cargo install diff, and we're going to do one level up, and we're going to do a diff. And everything works fine. So I think we are good to go. Do our cargo publish. Oops, that's my mistakes. Keywords cannot have spaces. The dry run could have caught this one, but that's okay. So this file has been changed. So we're we'll gonna git commit. And we're going to say fix cargo to ML keywords. And now we're gonna do the cargo publish. And hopefully that should work. And it does. So now if we go back to our terminal here, we should be able to do a cargo install diff. And now we should be able to do a diff and that's it. And it works fine. Okay, so now we are done about publishing. So we do need to update the git here. So if we do a git status, we see that we have one ahead of main. So we're going to do a git push origin. And that will update our main branch. And then we can tag this repository here. So we do a git tag v0.1.0. So that is the same version that we have there. And then we push these tags to GitHub. Okay, and now, by the way, if we go to Christ.io and we search for our diff, here's what we get. And that's it for this episode. Hope you liked it. Feel free to add a thumb up. Subscribe if you want to see more of the evolution of this library. I will probably create more videos about how to evolve this command line. And until next time, happy coding.